Our first scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Kings. If you're here for the memorial service yesterday, you heard a little of it. If you're here for service last night, you heard a lot of it. And you guys are going to get to hear some more. Yay. Uh, 2 Kings is the story of Elijah's ascending to heaven. It's in the second chapter. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? He said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were in Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they were both standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I'm taken from you. Elisha said, Please, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. This morning, as we affirm our faith, we will affirm our faith with the traditional uh, Apostles' Creed. I believe, and you can say this along with me, I think it'll be on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the can't tell not sleeping at night last night has affected my voice greatly so you're going to need to help me sing here okay we're going to sing the old rugged cross you can remain seated but if you're singing put your mask on
friends, you know, we come into a, the world is in an interesting place. And I think we sometimes think it's the worst it's ever been, it's the most horrible it's ever been, and I guess is people have thought that in all times. But God is still true. God is still the same. God is steadfast. And it's times like this, when we live in the midst of strife and trouble, that we most often find it comforting to turn to God. So let's turn to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in prayer. Oh God, you've always been our help in ages past. Even when we didn't know it. And you are our hope in the times where we live today. Sometimes, God, it gets so hard to see you because of the noise of the world. It's like trying to, to, to tune in one of those old TVs where you had to move the rabbit ears around. There's just lots of fuzz and snow in the picture. But God, when we're able to quiet the noise, in these times where it really is quiet and silent, we know you're there. And if we listen, if we just spend some time in quiet rest, we can hear you speak to us. Because God, you've told us you're always calling. You're chasing after us every day. In the 23rd Psalm, if we translated it more correctly, it would say you're chasing us all the days of our life. And sometimes we're so afraid to be caught. So we come to you with prayers for help and healing, and saving. And sometimes we forget to give you prayers of thanks for our life, for breath, for family, and for hope. Forgive us when we fall short. Forgive us for the times that either by sense of commission we directly fail you or sense of omission we just fail to stand up for you. Strengthen us with your spirit. Guide us through these troubled times. Help us to understand that there is something better coming in the future. And I don't mean when we die, God, it's coming. We just need to let you be in charge. We can follow you through the trees and the mountains and the valleys. And we can come to a place where we can really understand what you meant when you said, my peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. But God, remind us that you do not give peace like the world does. It isn't about financial security or even about our own health. It's about bringing the kingdom of God to the earth as it now exists in heaven. So we do pray for healing. And we pray for, pray for health. And we pray for safety. And in the midst of that, we remember the gift of life. The saving grace given to us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we're going to sing now. It's an old hymn. I, I, I've known it for years. 144. This is my father's world. If you would, if you would be standing as we sing, put your mask on, if you will, and then remain standing for, standing for the gospel. This is my father.
from the Gospel of Mark in the ninth chapter, beginning with verse 2. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to him Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for, Mo one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for you. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them. From the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with him anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. See. That was loud. Ouch. <laughs> Crank it up slowly, Johnny. That was really, are y'all awake? Yep. I am. <laughs> that was really loud. And it could be a little bit louder. There we go. You know, it's interesting that the Revised Common Lectionary, which is where I get my weekly studies, it's interesting to pair these two scriptures together, I think. You know, we know about the mountaintop experience, right? Everybody's had a mountaintop experience somewhere, haven't they? Uh, maybe when you first met your sweetheart or when you went to your first concert or when you graduated from high school or when you finally beat Mario Kart. <laughs> Y'all know what that is? Good. Y'all are, are yeah. hip. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, but but there are those times when you 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 know you, you get a or, or maybe when you win something or when you're in like in Rayburn when we beat Pasadena High School that was a mountaintop experience and I want to tell you it's been uh, that was in 1969 we're still relishing it <laughs> but you can't go back to it can you you can't go back and do it that's what this scripture is all about I think and, and it pairs with Elijah and Elisha I think perfectly because. The difference in Elisha and Elijah and, and the disciples and Jesus is Elisha was absolutely, no matter what, going to follow Elijah. Nothing was going to stop him. He was going to be there no matter what. There were no distractions. Everybody had, and they would they would come to him and say, You're, they're going to take away your master. He'd say, be quiet. He wasn't going to listen to the noise of the world. He was going to do what he needed to do to be a servant of God. Now you can argue that Peter was like that, but I would argue that Peter was much more impetuous. Peter was into the popularity part. If Jesus was walking in the water, Peter wanted to walk in the water. He didn't think about it. He didn't decide whether you could do it or not. He just wanted to be close to Jesus. And then when he realized what he'd gotten himself into, he started to sink. Now, I think there's a parallel to that in that time when we finally feel that, you know, it depends on how you grew up, right? I grew up in the Methodist Church, so I was baptized as an infant, and I had confirmation much later. But, but you know, those of you that, that walked down the aisle at age 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, that was a mountaintop experience, if not for you, for your family. And so many times people come to church, and they come for a while, and they, they don't get a mountaintop experience every time. I mean, sometimes, in fact, what happens is the preacher meddles a little bit. And they squirm a little bit in the chair, and they're not so happy about it, and they find ways to listen to the noise. You see, we need to be more like Elijah. We need to be more steady than opportunistic. We need to be ready to go forth every single day. If you'd asked me on September the 1st, 1989, if I was going to not drink for 31 plus years, I would have said, I don't know. But at the end of that 31 plus years, if you asked me, how did I do it? I would have to say, well, one day at a time. And, and I think so many times our faith is like that, right? I mean, we, we wake up with a new day every day. 
Every day is new. Every day is the day God gave us to live. Every day is the one we have to live it out to its fullest. We don't have tomorrow. We don't have yesterday. And so what Jesus is confronted with, with Peter up there is, is that on the mountaintop is that they're seeing everything about their religious heritage come to fruition. They got Moses, the prophet. They got Elijah, the number one prophet in all of the Bible. And they got Jesus. They're thinking, this is it. If you get all these three components together, the world's going to be perfect. And Jesus knows that's not right at all. In fact, he tells them, don't even talk about it until I'm resurrected. <laughs> so some years ago, I was serving at a, at a, a congregation that uh, had no, nothing anywhere anywhere on their building told you when their worship services were. It was like it was a secret. And you couldn't always tell by the cars. And so I made a comment one time. I said, you know, why don't we put a sign up that says we're open. And why don't we, you know, even if it's one of those neon ones that just says open. And why don't we, like, say when we're open. And, and they really didn't have a response. And and I said, well, you know, I know the Gospel of Mark regularly says, be quiet, don't talk about it right now, but it always says, until Jesus is resurrected. Okay, folks, let me tell you, Easter's coming, Jesus has been resurrected. Amen. We're supposed to talk about it. By Jesus' own command, we're supposed to talk about it. If you had a mountaintop experience in your religious life, your theological life, your study of God, why don't you ever tell that story? Some years ago, I had the opportunity to do a baptism for a family that was uh, of a Roman Catholic background. And so they brought all this stuff. I mean, they were Methodist at that time, but they had a background of being Roman Catholic. And so they brought all their stuff that, they, that their tradition says they do when they do a baptism. They had a little candle that we lit, and it stayed lit for the whole service. And they had a little box, and in that box they had a little Bible. And they had some other things. They were there, a shell, I think, and some other stuff. We used the shell to dip the water. Anyway, it was some stuff. And they put it in a box. And, you know, here I am. I'm a Protestant Methodist all my life. I don't really get it. And I said, well, why are we doing that? And they said, because this little child will be able to open that box and remember their baptism. Sometimes that symbolism is powerful, isn't it? <coughs> Do you remember your baptism? One of the questions they asked me when I went to seminary or when I went to, be a, to the conference to be a Methodist preacher, one of the first questions they said was, do you remember your baptism? Well, I said, no, I was six months old. They said, you don't know anything about it? I said, well, yeah, I know that mom told me she handed me to the preacher and I kicked the preacher and screamed the whole time. Then you do remember your baptism. Why is it important to remember your baptism? See, that is a mountaintop experience. Well, why is it important to remember it? Because at that event, whatever denomination you were at, we renounce the evil forces of wickedness and we embrace the power of Jesus Christ to live in to the new world. Can I borrow that thing that Christy wrote? Do you have it handy? Yeah. I don't know if she wrote it. or she did. did. she? Okay, it's wonderful. I've been attributed to her. Yeah. Uh, you mind if I share it? No, fine. That's perfect. So yesterday we celebrated Tom Griffin's life and his daughter wrote a piece. Yeah, this tells you a lot of things about Tom. It tells you about Tom's faith. It tells you about Christy's faith. And I just think it's so powerful, I want to share it. Now this is her writing to her dad, okay? This is not goodbye, this is a new, our new hello. The hello I will feel when the wind brushes my cheek on a cool windy day. The one I will hear when a song plays that reminds me of you. The one that surrounds me when I feel sad and alone. Yes, it's the new hello that I will find comfort with and know that you're always nearby. The hello that I will be greeted with when I hear my wind chimes chime. It will never be goodbye, Dad. It will just be our new hello. Do you understand what a difference that kind of faith makes? 
having that kind of faith to know that what we think is human loss is not really loss at all, it's gain. We sang that, this is my father's world hymn. Isn't that a wonderful song? You realize that we, if you read, if you if you went through every hymn in the United Methodist Hymnal, and I don't have it in front of me, there's a bunch of them, that you would have a pretty sound theological education. Because the words mean something. And I know sometimes me and, and the musicians get into a little uh, argument about how many verses we should sing. But the whole story is necessary. Now, there's some songs you can skip some verses. But it's like, listen, listen, you know, we, I want to hear the whole story. And in a John Wesley or Charles Wesley hymn, and there are several of those. Charles Wesley wrote 6,000 of them. There's a few of those in the hymnal. Every single one of Charles Wesley's hymns in the last verse you go to heaven. Because that's the plan, right? Yep. We live through the, the storms and the upsets and the hiccups and the losses. And we really do. We almost all have prayed the Lord's Prayer probably more times than we can ever count. And we've had that prayer I pray for God's kingdom to come on earth the way it is in heaven. Do we ever think about what that means? I do. Are there any hungry kids in heaven? No. Are there any people that can't get their COVID shot in heaven? No. <laughs> they don't need it. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, the reality is that that heaven picture is a picture of paradise where everything is okay. And we pray, Jesus taught us to pray that prayer, praying for that to come here. Not to wait till we die to go there, but to bring that here. And if we're going to be like Elisha, we're going to do it even when they tell us it won't work. Even when they tell us it's a bad plan. And when we do on occasion, once in a while, we'll get, get to be like Peter, James, and John on the top of that mountain where we see it all come to fruition. It's not guaranteed, but some of us will get to see it. Some of us will get to witness that moment in time when we know that everything that we learned in Sunday school or Bible study or through growing up, everything God has taught us is true. Now, many of you know I'm an eternal optimist. I choose to look at the, the glass. I, some people say, was the glass half full or half empty? I'm just glad I have a glass. <laughs> You know, and, and I, I think the reality is I believe God desires, wishes, wants, has empowered us that every single person would be saved. Everybody. And I think he called us to be part of doing it. Not that we save them, but we introduce them. We expose them. We Give them a chance to find out what it's like to be around somebody that really believes that. The story goes that uh, John Wesley had a, had a cohort whose name was uh, George Whitfield. Story goes about George Whitfield. He was, he, was the, he was not only theologically trained, he was theatrically trained. So he was a very dynamic preacher. He, he could do all kinds of cool stuff. People really listened. And the story goes that there's these two old farmers in town, and George Whitfield's in town in Georgia. They're going to have a revival. And, uh, and they say, well, why are you going? I don't think you really believe that stuff. And the farmer looked at the other one and said, I don't, but that guy preaching sure does. And I want you to know, I really believe this stuff. I really believe that Jesus really lived. I really believe that he was really persecuted and treated badly and politically killed. And even though that happened, he was victorious. Amen. Because the tomb is empty. Yeah. That's where I want to focus my time. That's where I want to focus my energy. When I can get really that focused in on my sights, being like Elisha is not so hard. I don't want it to stay like it was. I want it to be better. How about you? Amen. I hear people say, let's go back to the good old days. Let me tell you, it wasn't good. We didn't have air conditioning in the good old days. <laughs> Our black and white TV had these goofy rabbit ears and they didn't work all the time. Dad was too cheap to buy an outside antenna. <laughs> I 
don't want to go. Cars had, had no air conditioning. Did y'all ever have one of those? I did. Get stuck in traffic in a no air conditioning car. Try that out. The Gulf Freeway was two lanes north and two lanes south. And the great designers of the Gulf Freeway, when it went over the railroad tracks, every there was no feeder street, so everybody had to get on and get off. Driving to downtown Houston in those days was a monumental experience. The church. Oh, in the 50s, we had a lot of people in church. No question about it. 60s, a lot of people in church. Began to kind of go away in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s. So a lot of people have been complaining about COVID-19. Say, well, we've lost everybody. Some of them won't ever be back. I suspect that's very true. Some people won't come back because it's an easy habit to get into, isn't it? Not going. And we make it easy for them too because we're going to put it on the internet. They can stay in their pajamas and a little while they can watch if they want to. But they're missing out on the relationship that happens in the building. Now I know, I'm talking to y'all that are watching, some of you can't get here right now. That's okay. And we include you and we pray for you and we think about you, but we also miss you. As many of you know, we have a house in Somerville and we're going to retire there someday and Somerville has been through interesting places since I've been going there all my life. And they used to have downtown that had, you know, a dry goods store and a barber shop and a drug store. And then in the 90s, they had none of those, not even a drug store, no doctor, no pharmacy. <coughs> now they have a pharmacy. It's in the Brookshire Brothers grocery store, but things are a little better. They have a, a, a wonderful, incredible auto parts house that doesn't have a lot of stuff, but every time I've ever been there, they have what I need. And so many of the new locals, well, we're going to drive to Bryan or College Station to Brenham because the price is a little too high locally. You know, it costs money to drive 20 miles to Bryan or Brenham or somewhere else. If we don't participate in our local community, our local community will not exist. And that's part of the problem with the church is we got global and not local. Oh, we need to do global, no question about it. We support our missionary, we do that stuff, but friends, we're doing some incredible ministry here. So let me tell you a story about Chile. So we had a, a person gave us wasn't going to be here for Chile. We bought 10 tickets and said, what I'd like to happen to those 10 tickets is they go to 10 people that can't afford to come. Hopefully from the neighborhood. And another person put in some more. Thankfully, because we've been in this community for a long time, I go down the street to talk to a guy that lives down the street that I know cares and loves and takes care of people. And I said, I got these number of chilies for you. Can you hand them out? When he tells the stories, I know Chuck got to hear one of the stories, but when he tells the stories about the reception of those people that got it without expecting it, without knowing about it, some of them, that's the only meal they were going to have. You see, that's what the church in the community is for. Oh, it's to charge our batteries and get us ready for the trip out into the community, but if it doesn't go forth from there, What's the use? And I think that's kind of what Jesus was saying. Don't dwell. Don't, don't come down off this mountain and tell everybody how great it was to be with Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Hang in there. we got work to do. You know, someday this church will probably have a decent preacher. <laughs> I mean, that probably will happen someday. But for now, you got me. And, and I want to tell you, as long as we're willing to go out and do everything we can, as often as we can, as much as we can, for somebody besides us, I think we're successful. I don't care how many people are here. I'd rather have 100 people that were working hard for Christ than 3,000 or whatever, 64,000 sit down there off of 59. Nothing against those guys. I just would rather be a part of somebody that was hands-on doing something. How about y'all? And, and so for me, 
it was a mountaintop experience to hear that, that 14 or 15 people got to eat because we had a chili fundraiser. That's a mountaintop experience. This last summer, Bill Nash, some of you don't know about Bill Nash, but Bill Nash is a, a friend of mine that does a, uh, he's a country western singer-songwriter, wrote some music that you all, all have heard, but he, uh, uh, he has a thing called Champions Kids Camp that has been going now for almost 20 years. And we have been supporting him every year. We have him come for a concert. We raise money. We sponsor children. It costs $500 to sponsor a kid to his camp. We have sent as many as 20. We had sent 20 last year. It was COVID, right? We couldn't send that many. I think we sent 11, 12. And it's harder to do when you don't have all these big numbers, right? But, but I want to tell you, when you see the kids, we, we took a field trip out there, we see the kids, these kids that were CPS kids that had no, uh, effectively, no mom or dad. They were in the CPS program. They were there as campers when they were five or six or seven or eight. And now they are returning as counselors to be a part of that. You see, that's the circle that happens when you get involved with something that's doing the faith thing, where you recharge your faith by recharging your faith. We should never forget from where we come. We need to have history. We need to pay attention to it. We don't want to do some of that stuff again. But we also know that the history is now being written. The Christian story is not finished. It's being told. And we are the people, the actors in the play. What part will you play? It's okay. Any of the parts are good. Support's good, right? You, when you have a play, you've got to have support people. You've got to have stage hands and fix stuff up. All those are important. But everybody has to work together to make it happen. They go down, you go down to the Worthen Center or Jones Hall, and you see a big production. It's not just the actors. In fact, they're the smallest part of the pie. It's the people behind the scenes that give the money and provide the, the setting and do all the other stuff that make the real difference. That's where the church is. Christ is the main actor. He will do the work, but we've got to set the stage for him. I love Elijah and Elijah. I love that story. And I, I think all of us have an Elijah in our life, right? Somebody that we want what they have. And, and I think all of us also can identify with that mountaintop experience. We just wish we could just stay there. Well, I've had so many times in my career where I was exactly where I thought I wanted to be until they made a, a, a structural change. <laughs> you know, I had this great job. I was national accounts manager for Quest Communications. I had these great accounts in Houston, and they changed everything. You know, that's the way it works. Kind of a funny story is when I was selling farm equipment, our boss was the owner of the company. His name was Charlie Howard. He was a big... Uh, kind of loud, uh, nice guy, but you knew where Charlie stood. Charlie came into the sales guys one day and he said, I got a whole stack of, it was a, a particular brand name, Bush Hog, but it's all iron out. There's things like Bush Hogs and, and greater blades and stuff. He says, it's all out there in the corner. I had the shop move it all out there. That needs to be sold this week. A $50 bonus. He stuck it up there on the wall. $50 bill for the one that sells the most. Man, we got busy. We cleared that stack. It was gone by Friday. You know what happened Monday? A truck came and filled it up again. It never ends. It never ends. I was fortunate enough to learn some of those lessons early in life. We can't just get to a place and say, let's just stay here. Neither can we whine and complain when it changes. So, yeah, you know, Pasadena is changing. It is. There's no question. Every community is changing. People are moving in. People are moving out. But I guarantee you there are still plenty of people that don't yet have a good, solid relationship with Jesus Christ to more than fill this building and every other church in this community. And this isn't a contest. I wish, I wish the best for Golden Acres Baptist and the Assembly of God up the street and, and the Catholic Church down the street. I think if we can all do better, the rising tide raises all the boats. 
And when we can do that, then we begin to build a community that once again has the strength to stand up against the forces of evil. Meanwhile, they just keep sneaking in. A few years ago, it was K2. That was the thing everybody was smoking or doing something with. We stood up. We got the city council to pass laws, even before the state did. But we're so consumed with our own mountaintop stuff, we don't know the stuff that needs to be done. We got streets that need to be repaired. We got work that needs to be done. We need to be involved in our civic community. Not just leave it up to somebody else. I think that's the that's the Elisha. What I would, if I was going to write a book, that'd be the, the Elisha component. Is be steadfast. Nothing stops you. I think it was Chamberlain that said, never, 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 never give up. Friends, we've got the greatest opportunity of our lifetime right now for the Christian family. There are a lot of people out there looking for something. And they can't do much. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things they can't do, but they can get exposed to a different kind of a virus. One that lasts eternally, that takes them to eternal life, that reunites them with their family, that brings them together as a community eternally. The scripture says, don't tell them about it till I'm resurrected. Let me say it again. Jesus Christ has risen. Amen. Now, I know that's an early message, but it's not Lent yet. Lent starts next week. I can give those kind of messages. But, you know, during Lent, we have little, little Easter's every Sunday, so we get to take a break from, from Lent. Uh, just as an aside, we will not be having an Ash Wednesday service this year. I, uh, I can't figure out how to do it safely, no, so we're not going to do it. Uh, other people are using Q-tips and stuff. I just think it's too close inter interaction at this stage of the game. We will do it in the future, uh, but we will not do it this year. But we will put something online. We will start to talk about Lent. We'll start to talk about things like repent, believe the gospel. We'll start to give the same message that says, friends, wherever you are, whatever you've been up to, if that noise of the world has been so strong and so powerful, now is the time to turn down the volume on the noise and turn to follow Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and I'm thinking we're going to be able to do it. And we're going to do it together. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's a great joy to be with everybody in our church. I love our church, and I love everybody that's here. Those of you that are at home, I love you too. I love the opportunity we have to get together, but I also love the fact that, that what I see as I look out in the audience is a bunch of people that said, if I just knew how to do it, I would. Don't spend too much time worrying about the logistics. Just do what you can. Wesley had that great formula. How many times have you heard me say it? Do no harm. Do all the good you can. And he was more specific on stay in love with God. He said, attend upon the ordinances of God, which are holy conferencing, holy communion, scripture, and prayer. I think that's how we approach Ash Wednesday. That's how we approach Lent. And I think, frankly, that's how we approach the hope of the future. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So our closing hymn today is Go Make of All Disciples. Imagine that. <laughs>
we've had the chance today to reflect upon our mountaintop experiences, to talk about our faithful following of Jesus Christ as Elisha followed Elijah. And now we're called to go out into the world to do the work. In the name of a loving and creative God, a sweet, gentle, and forgiving Jesus, and the encourager of the Holy Spirit, go forth and do it. Amen. Amen. Amen.